and we want it to be part of a company that's trying to find solutions to drive capital to clean energy because it's important, not because you make money doing it, but because it's actually an, an important generational challenge for us to tackle. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thangen, so let's get into it. Well, welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast. I'm excited to have our guest today, Tom Byrne. He's actually the founder and CEO of Clean Capital. Clean Capital actually is an investor in solar projects and in-service assets, but they've actually are now moving earlier stage and they have a unique platform, a technology platform that allows them to basically look at a lot of opportunities and kind of streamline. And Tom, definitely would love to hear you speak more about that and more about your background. I know before you founded the company with your other co-founders, I think it's been in business about three and a half years. You were at True Green Capital, which is a solar private equity fund that invests in distributed assets. Then you have a legal background and worked at two major law firms, Aiken Gump and Chadbourne Park, which I'm sure you've done a lot of project finance related energy deals. And I thought it was interesting too, that I guess you went to Berkeley undergrad and then law school at UCLA, but it would be great to hear more about your background, how you got into solar and and our podcast too is about entrepreneurship. What made you transition from a legal sort of background to then, I know at True Green, you're a partner and then general counsel to then now the CEO. And I know that's a million questions, by the way. I'll try to unpack them in as as much as a condensed way as possible. So first of all, awesome to be here. Congratulations on launching the podcast. Speaking as a podcaster myself, I think it'll be a great experience for you. So my career started after I graduated Berkeley. I started working for an environmental organization called Waterkeeper Alliance. So I was an environmentalist at heart. And through that experience, I helped launch a bunch of local environmental organizations. And I worked with a lot of lawyers, which inspired me to go to law school. As you mentioned, I went to UCLA Law School. And as I was canvassing the job opportunities that were available for uh, when I graduated, I was keen to keep doing something that was in keeping with my sort of environmental roots. And the one burgeoning area that was coming out, this is like 07, 08, was clean energy. And I sent an application or a resume in to work at Chadbourne and Park and was hired there to work in the Renewable Energy Finance Group. At that point, there was probably two or three law firms doing renewable energy finance. Um, Sure, which is amazing now because there's so many law firms that are involved. Oh, there's there's dozens. It's unlimited amount of lawyers you can hire to now do this work. But the time was interesting because it was 2008, and we were right in the middle of the financial crisis. And law firms and banks, they were laying people off left and right, and renewable energy was slowly growing. And then fast forward to the inauguration of President Obama and the passage of the American Recovery Act, which had embedded in it a whole host of incentives for renewable energy. There was the DOE loan guarantee program, the cash grant program, and a number of other ones. So while the entire country was in recession, we at Chadburn and Park had more work and more deals to work on than we had bodies to cover them. So I got great experience in the early days of the renewable energy sector. And then, as you mentioned, it fast forward. Then I got in, went to Aiken Gump and then got onto the investor side with True Green Capital before launching Clean Capital at the uh, end of 2015. Wow. And they actually, Clean Capital has a podcast called Experts Only, and you could find it on your website. It's also on iTunes as well and and Google Play. And you do a lot of the interviews, also John Powers as well, who's the president of Clean Capital. Can you talk about to date the projects that you've done? I know you recently announced the partnership that you did with BlackRock and the transaction recently. I thought it was pretty interesting because it was smaller projects yeah. So from a due diligence perspective, I thought it was like a very interesting opportunity and maybe your platform or what you guys use sure. to filter uh, so, projects. Yeah. So we formed a partnership with BlackRock earlier this year. And prior to that, 
So we have two partnership vehicles. We invest through two vehicles. One is with BlackRock. The other one is with Carval Investors. Carval Investors is the investment arm of Cargill, the large agricultural company. And both vehicles serve similar purposes, which is consistent with sort of the, the core components of clean capitalist business, which is institutional capital plus technology plus distributed assets. That's sort of the nexus that we exist in and where we had the most value. With both Carval and BlackRock, neither had invested in distributed generation at all. And what we were able to do for them was provide investment opportunities, cut through a lot of the complexity, and serve up to them on a silver platter, effectively, a cohesive, sound investment opportunity. And we keep on doing that, and we continue to do that through the distributed energy space. That's the value for for an investor that's looking to deploy capital in the tens of millions of dollars as opposed to the hundreds of thousands, which is... You know, most of these distributed energy assets, they might only be a $2 million, $3 million investment at a time. Sure. And that's just not large enough for institutional capital. Definitely. So the challenge that we're trying to solve and that we are solving is getting institutional capital into the distributed energy space because it's vitally important that that capital, that we attract institutional capital into that space to grow clean energy broadly. Definitely. I guess the first transaction that you worked with BlackRock is it was a 46.9 megawatt project with Ahana Renewables and it was projects in California, Massachusetts and New Jersey. And it's pretty impressive because you've been in business for three and a half years and you've invested, I guess, 250 million in operating assets. Yeah. Do you focus on certain states? Obviously, California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, are states that are ideal because they have high cost of electricity yeah. and great incentives. Is there markets that you guys prefer to develop projects, not just in-service assets, yeah. but also, you know, it sounds like you're purchasing earlier stage assets that are not in-service. Yeah. We were talking earlier about storage. What markets do you guys like based on incentives or other reasons? So, High electricity costs, yeah, so solar we, radiance. Yeah, so we focus on, at the top of the funnel, is just distributed assets. And distributed assets can mean operating solar, new build solar. It can mean small wind. It could even mean small hydro. It can mean energy efficiency, storage, oh, wow. fuel cells. That's all distributed generation and all of those assets are a vital part of the solution to climate and to growing clean energy. So they need capital, right? So we view ourselves as adding value when we can get the Black Rocks, Carvals, the insurance companies. We did deals with John Hancock. When you get pensions into that asset class, we don't necessarily have a preference on, on jurisdictions. We've done deals in 12 different states. We've acquired assets. Our first acquisition was actually only, even though we've existed for three years, it wasn't until the end of 2016. So it's really been since then that we put you know, north of $250 million out in less than two and a half years. But what we're trying to do is where there is distributed assets, regardless of jurisdiction, we want to be finding solutions to put money into those markets. But naturally, you flow to, there are a few macro drivers of where deals are getting done. Firstly, as you mentioned, if there's high power prices, it's easier to do renewable energy. But as we all know, the cost trends of renewable energy continue to go down. Panel prices continue to go down, even with tariffs in place. And there's going to be more states where solar is going to be and clean energy is going to be cost competitive, even if there's not very large electricity prices. So that's macro trend one. Macro trend two is where there's a lot of irradiation, where there's a lot of sunshine, especially for solar or wind, for wind projects. So that's sort of a macro driver. And then the third macro driver is incentives. And incentives can trump everything because in New Jersey and Massachusetts, two huge states for renewable energy and huge states for solar, they obviously don't have the same sunshine as California, Arizona, or Texas, but they have a policy commitment in place that's really driving them into a leadership position in both solar 
and increasingly storage, which is super exciting the last few years. Definitely. How does clean capital differ from other investors? Obviously, what we've seen is, it's funny, a few years ago, people weren't comfortable with solar as an asset class. You're, yeah. you're sort of big sort of investors, it's, and it's pretty impressive to hear how you've been able to get big companies to be comfortable. How do you differentiate from other companies, especially, um, I feel like it's so competitive now for assets and to purchase these assets. So we focused on a market where I think there's a need and where, where we add value, which is, yeah. as I keep saying, distributed generation. Sure. So firstly, I don't know if that distinguishes us from other companies, but that's an important component of our business. But when I think of what distinguishes us, there's two things that immediately came to mind. The first is we have, we're flexible in what we can invest in. We are not a private equity fund, which your traditional private equity model is you raise a ton of capital. You have a very narrow box mandate of what you can invest in, and you spend the next four years investing in that narrow box, right? So Definitely. in our business, a lot changes in four years, both from a return and risk profile, but also from new asset classes that sure. come out. Like if you raised a private equity fund four years ago, you probably wouldn't be able to invest in storage very easily because it wasn't part of your investment mandate. At Clean Capital, we didn't want to be boxed in like that. As I keep saying, we wanted to be able to distribute cash and investment dollars throughout the distributed generation market. So we create investment vehicles with specific institutional investors to, that have specific purposes, Definitely. but that does not limit us from creating another investment vehicle for energy efficiency sure. or storage. Uh, with BlackRock, we're going to, going to be investing in a lot of storage in the next two years. So we're able to be flexible. So that's distinction number one. Distinction number two is our belief in technology, software, and data analytics. So we've built a diligence as a service platform that we only use internally for ourselves, our investors, our lenders, and our law firms and advisors. And that diligence as a software platform tracks the entire life cycle of a transaction, which simplifies the investment process for sure. us from origination to diligence to acquisition to ultimately asset reporting and asset management. All of that is done through our proprietary platform that streamlines the process and makes it simpler for us to analyze more efficiently and more accurately the assets that we buy. And then the third distinction, and one of the reasons why me and my co-founders, John Powers and Mark Garrett, who's our CTO, formed Clean Capital is because we always wanted to be mission-oriented. We feel that there is a humongous challenge in front of us right now. As you read anything from the UN climate uh, reports to, sure. to any host of news publications reporting about hurricanes, fire, fires. There's a huge generational challenge ahead of us, and we want it to be part of a company that's trying to find solutions, trying to do innovative things, press the limits a little bit to drive capital to clean energy, because it's important, not because simply because it's for the bottom line and you make money doing it, but because it's actually an, an important generational challenge for us to tackle. And we want it to be to the best of our ability at the forefront of doing so. Definitely. Oh, that's amazing. And that's great to hear. And actually, John Powers used to work with President Obama yeah. in his, I guess there was a sustainability for the military. John, well, yeah, yes. John, John's an amazing person. John served in Iraq. Uh, he's an Iraq war veteran. He served, actually, we met because he served with my brother-in-law. And then he came back from the States, from overseas, excuse me. And he, he did a number of really cool things. He launched a program to help kids in Iraq after his experience, raise money to do that. Then he got started to get into politics. He ultimately ran for Congress in 08 that was unsuccessful, ended up launching and helping or helping to launch the U.S. Army's renewable energy program in like 2009, 2010. And then Obama, President Obama recruits him to become chief sustainability officer for the federal government where he enacted a lot of initiatives along with many, uh, with Kate Brandt and a couple of others sure. who, who had that same role, a couple of initiatives that were still benefiting from the greening of the federal government, the greening Definitely. of the United States military services. He played a hand in a lot of that stuff before ultimately moving on to the private sector. And, and he couldn't help himself. He wanted to keep doing innovative things and pushing the needle. And that's how him and I partnered on Clean Capital. Sure. Oh, that's pretty amazing. So can you talk about, I guess, this is a kind of a continuation, really, 
about entrepreneurship. What made you, obviously you work for two very big law firms. You work for a, a solar private equity firm. What made you say, hey, I'm going to do something on my own, obviously with John and Mark. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about that whole process? Obviously, it would just be Yeah, it was, it was. So I left my Cush law firm job, I think in 2012, and that was concurrent with the birth of my first child. So my wife thought I was crazy when I did that. That was to go to True Green Capital. And I think I left then True Green. Once True Green was becoming a very successful private equity fund, I I decided to leave there concurrent with the birth of my second child. (laughs) Um, So my wife, again, thought I was even crazier. Now we've had our third child uh, in three months ago. Congratulations. And thank you very much. And Clean Capital is now off to the races and doing great stuff. And I promised her that there will be, <laughs> there will be no, uh, no change of plans with Clean Capital. But That's an amazing story, by the way. That shows that you actually have an appetite for taking calculated risk and believing in yourself and what you're doing. Yeah, it's a longer story in how I came to tolerate risk. But life's too short, right? And the risk that you perceive is not as big a risk as it really is. It's more fearful when you look out at the risk than when you're actually living in it. So looking out at leaving a law firm job to work at as a partner of a young burgeoning private equity firm looked risky from the outside looking in. And then when you get in there, it becomes a much more tolerable risk. And the same could be said of when we started Clean Capital. But there is a risk tolerance that you have to find acceptable. I think most people don't find it acceptable, and that's why they don't get into entrepreneurship. But I would would encourage people to evaluate the risk in the grand scheme of things. And if you do that, you may find that it's much more tolerable. But I left True Green, which is a great firm, and, and I'm great friends with all of the guys there, and they're doing great stuff. But it was because I started paying much closer attention to data analytics, software, technology. And I knew there was a lot of really exciting things happening in other sectors of fintech, you know, as it's been dubbed. And the very solutions that others were embracing and utilizing in real estate and consumer loans, I thought there was a lot of kernels of those of that to be applied to clean energy. And that would be part of a solution to drive more capital into clean energy. So as I kept evaluating the opportunity it got increasingly more interesting for me and then john and i started actually thinking about this in 2014 Mm -hmm. and before we finally towards the end of 2015 said you know we think we have we talked to enough people we evaluated the risk and we decided you know there's something really interesting here if we can couple uh, institutional capital with technology and dis- and flow that capital into the distributed energy space. We thought there was a really interesting business model. There was tons of ups and downs along the way that we never would have expected, but 2018 for us was really a breakthrough year. Uh, the business model crystallized. We signed some amazing partnerships, and, and we feel great about 2019. That's great. Congratulations. You kind of mentioned one of the, this is actually kind of goes into my other trend is what tips do you have for someone who wants to be an entrepreneur? I know you mentioned about understanding the risk that's involved and that the risk probably is not as big as you thought it was going to be. What other suggestions would you have for someone who? There could be suggestions or what characteristics do I think people should reflect upon before they take the risk is, first of all, are you willing to work hard? It's sort of a precondition that you're willing to work hard to be successful. Are you competent? Do you have like a, a core skill set that the market needs and that, that will help grow your company? In other words, like if you're not a software engineer, I don't suggest launching a company to build the next uh, Twitter or, or, sure. or something like that. <laughs> and looking at your business model or, or what you're trying to do, is there a value in the market? And I think you have to ask yourself really hard those questions. Can I work hard? Do I have the competencies? And is there a value proposition here? And hopefully the answer to all those is yes. So that's like a starting place. And then you have to reflect even more on on whether you're ready to bear the risk and the ups and downs of starting a company. The, The early stages are... Shoot, the first year, I mean, even even to this day, we're three years old and there's still tons of challenges. But certainly in the first year where you probably don't have any revenue or very little revenue, 
no investors were really knocking on your door to invest in, in the sure. company, or at least this was our experience, right? Yes. We had a handful of investors who were interested and one seed investor who ultimately took the risk on us. Um, so just not having revenue and then having to find investor dollars, the paranoia of how do you keep the ship afloat for that first year is intense. So you have to be willing to bear that. But like I said earlier, like after you run through your checklist on this stuff and whether it's the right thing for you, if you have the appetite to do it, to be an entrepreneur, you got to do it because that bug is not going to go away. And you don't want to wake up with grandchildren and just a story about something you were going to do rather than having actually tried to do it. I think that's huge. You know, it's better to try than have that regret. Yeah. And I think that's huge. That's a great point. Yeah. And that's, Life's too short, as you mentioned again, you know. What's the saying from, uh, I think it was Steve Jobs or someone, life's too short to live someone else's dreams. You that's know? And true. I think that, that makes great, sense. That's a great quote. Yeah. Going back to something that you mentioned, that with BlackRock, they have a mandate for storage. Before we went on the podcast, yeah. we were talking about, obviously, everyone's talking about storage. Everyone's trying to figure out. Yeah. And we're talking about different markets that you guys are looking at for storage. <laughs> Can you talk about which markets that you like and, and why? And how do you look at, are you looking at coupling solar plus storage, which we kind of talked about, right. which you could talk about as well. Are you also looking at standalone storage as well? Are you open? Yeah. To- I, so before we started the podcast, we discussed an opportunity that Clean Capital um, worked on and to buy a bunch of storage assets. And we were ultimately, we ended up not doing it. But what I learned from that experience was, whereas I thought we were late to the game, as investors in storage, that taught me that there weren't a lot of investors in the space. There was a lot of talk about participating in storage investing, but there wasn't a lot of dollars actually flowing into it. So I actually now kind of feel like we're at the earlier stages sure. of the investment cycle. But it's a very important piece of the puzzle, whether you look at the duck curve in California Definitely. and the burgeoning duck curve in Massachusetts. I think that the need to address the influx of clean energy to the grid, the need to do that is helped by storage, right? I don't know Definitely. if it solves it. So it's an important piece of the clean energy puzzle. So if, if that's the case, then we want to be at the forefront. We Clean Capital wants to be a progressive investor into the storage space. And we are fortunate that we have two partnerships with investors who share the same exact goal, BlackRock and Carval. They want to be aggressive into storage and into distributed assets more broadly because not because there's a a revenue model which there is but also because it's an important if you're an investor in clean energy you need to be able to participate in that space your question about where we're participating so far we've looked in california massachusetts and a little bit in new jersey and the reason is those three states do have incentives california has sgip massachusetts has the smart program new jersey likely we'll have some sort of incentive here in the next 12 months that provides a good baseline revenue stream, which us as investors, we rely on at this point. We're not comfortable sure. enough at Clean Capital with ancillary services Definitely. as a revenue model. We want to have some component that's predictable. Sure. Um, so that's why we're kind of going after deals in those markets. That makes sense, then going merchant. And then uh, the SMART program, basically, they have an incentive, an adder for, yeah. for storage, and that's what Tom's talking about. What other trends are you seeing in the solar space right now that maybe, obviously everyone talks about storage, everyone's talking about how the tariffs and things like that, that costs continue to go down. What sort of major trends that you, you're seeing that you think might be different right. from what so, everyone else has been talking about? So Software uh, as a platform, I think too, which obviously you guys have, I think a lot of people are using software as a way of... Uh, and they have to, right? It, it, Software, data analytics, they have to be a piece, in my opinion at least, of a sound investment approach because they're, they streamline things, make it more efficient, and data analytics makes things more accurate if applied correctly. Definitely. When thinking about more uh, about trends, I, I was asking my colleagues today um, what they think there are some macro trends in the market. And I don't know that this is a trend, but one of the cooler ones was that with the uplift in the amount of electric vehicles that we have 
that are, are being in use, those electric vehicles are going to be increasingly used as batteries sure. to ultimately flow power back to the grid yeah, during definitely. peak times, right? So that's not a trend. That's really just like a cool outcome of the growth of electric vehicles. That's one thing that Derek, I credit Derek Daly, my colleague, with uh, that trend. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though, to think about that, you know, once more electric vehicles come online, that they could be used instantaneously. But did you ever think to... about that a year ago? I never no, thought. No, I, I never, I never, I never did... thought about it until recently. I, someone told me, and I was, like, kind of blown away because, you know, the proliferation or the growth of electric vehicles, obviously it's going to be a long time before it's mainstream, but still, you know, 50 years from now. Right. It's going to be less than 50 years. Yes. So I, I think Derek was saying like, um, I don't remember the statistics, but like by 2025, if you have, if California is 20% electric vehicles, sure. that's like enough to offset peak power somehow. Yeah, so it's, it's that's I, pretty amazing, actually. 20% I, I never peak, thought yeah. about it, but until, and, and someone mentioned it to me three months ago and then Derek reinforced it today. And it's just one of these offshoots of the transforming grid or the transforming power sector that was never even on someone's radar. And I wonder what other ones are going to pop up over the next sure. 10 years that you can't even fathom the byproducts of this transformation and they start to reveal themselves. So that's one cool trend. And then the other, the other trend that I pay attention, a lot of attention to and we at Clean Capital to is the increase in institutional capital in this space. And it's woefully inadequate at this point to address climate change or fundamentally transform the power sector. But there is clearly an increased appetite from institutional investors to participate in this space. I think a lot of them just don't quite know where to put their money. Is it public vehicles? Is it funds? Is it what have you? So that's one of the solutions we at Clean Capital are trying to solve. But I think the industry has to solve that more broadly, right? There's a statistic the World Economic Forum put out 0.5% 0.5% of institutional capital is in is in clean energy and that's even like in the broadest sense sure. that is not enough not even close mm-hmm. to enough institutional capital participation to really make a dent wow actually i had no idea about this this yeah. That's pretty monumental. Um, we're coming to the end of the podcast. You know, for our listeners who are who have an interest in solar and entrepreneurship, is there any books that you would suggest reading? I know you you talked about a book for one yeah. of your podcast interviews that you had recently, but I don't I, know if you recommend anything in particular. I read two books uh, recently. One is Taming the Sun by Varun Sivaram, uh, which is a wonderful sort of dissection of the renewable energy market from the burgeoning of the clean energy market to how these deals are getting financed to how we're going to solve some of the challenges in the future. It's not just an introduction. It's actually quite in depth, but it's a good canvassing of of the space that we uh, work in. That's number one. And then number two, Uh, The Grid by Gretchen Bach, who is a professor at McGill University. It is an anthropological study of the grid from its formation in the late 1800s to how it's transformed on multiple times in the last 125 years. Uh, It's beautifully written. It talks about the grid, which is what we operate in on a daily basis, and is a great history. And I encourage all readers to take a look at those two books. Those are the first two that come to mind. Yeah, definitely. Those are books I'll definitely add to my list of many books that I'm trying to read. (laughs) The pile gets thicker. It does. (laughs) For every one I read, I add three. So it's like (laughs) my bedside is growing. It's funny. I'm actually, you know, I use Kindle or I also like to use Audible as well, just because it allows me to do other stuff as well. Well, yeah, I use, I love Audible. Audible is great, and, and it's good for long car rides. I still like old fashioned books, and I still like old fashioned newspapers. Oh um, wow! Too, and I I still get the paper on Saturday and Sunday. That's amazing. I mean, you know, I don't hear a lot of people who do that, so that's pretty amazing that you. Whether still do whether that. Yeah. my three kids let me <laughs> read it, read, read it, <laughs> you know, it, it does serve as great kindling for the fire pit, sure. if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> That is pretty funny. If anyone in the podcast or the, what we call the Mavericks, because it's the Solar Maverick podcast, want to reach out to Clean Capital, are you? What's the best way to connect? Feel free to email me directly. I'm very sure. responsive to emails at tbyrne at cleancapital.com. 
you can reach out to any of my colleagues at the same sort of uh, email address with their names, not my name. Definitely. And then obviously you're on LinkedIn and you could go to their website, which is cleancapital.com. Obviously check out, it's members only, right? Or ex- experts, experts only. only. So the best way, yeah, I definitely encourage all these podcast listeners to check out experts only similar to you. We have uh, great guests on it from a whole host of different topics, generally in the clean energy and finance space. Yeah. And actually we had an interview with Chris Grablitz from PV Pros, which is an o and yeah, company. Sure based in Hoboken, New Jersey. And he actually gave a shout out to your podcast during awesome. our interview. We, so appreciate, just... we appreciate Chris and PV Pros. We worked with them a lot. Oh, great. That's free advertising. PV Pros. <laughs> I'm sure PV Pros enjoys <laughs> the free advertising. So thank you again, Tom, for being on the podcast. Thanks this was uh, amazing. And uh, we look forward to continued conversations. Great. Thanks, Thanks so you. much. Been Thanks. Fun. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please go to iTunes and Stitcher Radio and leave us a five-star review. That helps us build this community, and that's what we're all about right now, building this community as big as we can to deliver as much value as we can. 